Well, hello and welcome. This is Wesley Smith with Tree Service Marketing Profits Podcast. And we've got another episode today with an expert. So this is along with our expert interview series. Uh, we do all kinds of marketing topics, webinars, and then also expert interview series with business owners who are willing to share their story in the tree service space. Today, we've got Jeff Gruy on, the founder and CEO of Arbor Aesthetics in Omaha. Jeff, welcome aboard. Hey, good to be here, Wes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on and sharing your story. I think you got a lot of great things to share good insights about the business and other things that you want to talk about too. So I guess, tell us a little bit about uh, Arbor Aesthetics, maybe, you know, when you got started, maybe what you did before you started your business, kind of oh. where, where it went after you got going. Well, what I did before I started my business was I was a, you know, failing student on my like fourth, seventh year and fourth major and, you know, 15 hours short of graduating and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life and largely unemployable. I was a hard worker, but I always had my own ideas. And so, you know, the landscaping firm that I worked for the year prior didn't hire me back in 2005. So I, I handed out a flyer around my neighborhood offering to do yard work. And I just unwittingly started a tree company. I mean, college kid willing to dig holes and mow grass and trim trees. And I got, I got a tree trimming job and I happened to be really good at it. I had a knack for making trees beautiful. And it's, you know, it's one of those examples in life where you do something, you get out of your comfort zone. Cause I was really uncomfortable putting that flyer out. In fact, I didn't even have the courage to put the flyer out myself. I had my stepbrother, my 10 and 12 year old stepbrothers do it for me. So sure, they, door to door is something else. Yeah. You're not door kidding. to door. My yeah. kids are just putting it in their, in the doors. And I got a huge response. I got a lot of calls and mm -hmm. I just stumbled into a line of work that I was born to do. I mean, uh, 17 years ago, I was just brilliant at making trees beautiful. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I mean, I had no exposure to it previously. I mean, I knew how to work hard, but that's all I really knew. Awesome. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. That's that's how it started. You know, fast forward a few months I, later, I took on this large tree removal for this elderly lady, lady, you know, ladder 35 feet up in the air, bungee corded to the first branch, power pruner fully extended, cutting branches off. It's landing next to me. And... <clears throat> I realized in that moment that I was either going to kill myself or I was going to destroy this old woman's house. So I got down and I said, ma'am, I don't, I, I don't know how to remove this tree without, you know, potentially causing a lot of harm. I'm going to go home. I'm going to buy some ropes and some videos and books and I'll learn how to climb and I'll be back. So that was Halloween of 05. And the day after Christmas of 05, I'd successfully climbed my little pin oak in my backyard and I proceeded to remove this uh, tree over the next two weeks, like chopping up, chopping up three foot logs so I could lift it up and put it into the back of my truck by halogen lamps in the middle of the night. Uh, Cause you know, it gets dark at five o'clock and yeah. um, just work that I would never ask my team members to do, but I was living my best life um, starting my business. And that, and it was with that job that I realized I had to choose between finishing my degree or going all in on Arbor Aesthetics. And it was, it was a no brainer for me. I had never mm -hmm. done anything I loved so much in my life. And so it was Arbor Aesthetics all the way from that point on. Awesome. Well, was honesty, was the best honesty was the best policy there then. Huh? You told her, hey, look, I'm going to be back. I'm going to figure out how to do this. I'm going to be back to take care of it for you. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'll be back <laughs> when I figure it out. Right. That's that's the best way to do it, to let people know, you know, and you did that and moved on and successfully got it taken care of. And then um, so from that point, take me through your thought process. You were thinking, well, do I go back to school and continue doing something that I just don't particularly want to be spending my time doing, or do I want to move forward with this business? And so at that particular moment, you chose the business and oh, yeah. take us through that first kind of several months of getting that off the ground and everything. Um, well, you know, like if you haven't read the E-Myth, I recommend everybody out there, especially young entrepreneurs, read the E-Myth Revisited because most entrepreneurs don't start their business with the idea of, hey, I'm going to I'm going to start a business. I know what I'm doing. I mean, you know, I see the economic potential here. No, it's just you have this entrepreneurial itch. I think I can make money doing this. I handed out a flyer. I thought I could make money doing this. And then over a few weeks or a few months ago, oh, shit, I'm really making money. And um, like so many early, I was a technician that started a business. I was good at trimming trees. I was learning my craft, but I did not know how to run a business, right? So uh, it was day to day. I had no path forward. I was figuring it out 
as I went along and as, you know, I bought more equipment as the phone stopped ringing. I mean, you know, the phone stopped ringing at one point when the flyers stopped working. So I had to go knocking on doors. And this was another, you know, overcoming fears because I'm, uh, you know, before I started this business, if you'd handed me a thousand dollars cash and said, go knock on that door and ask for their business. Absolutely not. Ten thousand dollars. Maybe I wouldn't have done it. That was just so outside of my comfort zone. But it ended up being something that I was really good at doing. I enjoyed doing it. And um, yeah, there wasn't much of a plan. I was figuring it out day by day, making terrible decisions and learning as I went. I think that's a common story. I think people a lot of times start off as the, you know, the the tech, the person doing the work, the tree trimmer, the tree removal guy, the whatever you want to call it in any in any yeah. niche, any blue collar niche, right? And then you kind of see that you have to evolve as a person to grow a business. It's a whole different set of skills, right? As you kind of keep going. It is an entirely different set of skills. I mean, that's not how we operate today. We, I mean, we've got, you know, strategy is very important. Planning is very important. Um, and the sooner that I would say you out there, the young tree service owner or wherever you are in your growth cycle, becoming aware of, um, you need to do more than just cut the trees. You have to have, you know, a plan for how you're going to grow, how you're going to spend your money, where you're going to allocate your resources, where new work is going to come in. It's this bigger picture that you need to become aware of. A great book to start with is um, The E-Myth Revisited. Uh, the sooner that you can have systems for how to manage your business, um, the, well, I would say that's the first step, one of the first steps to beginning to scale your business from, you know, yourself to a crew to two crews. Uh, because as your company grows, it becomes exponentially more complicated to manage. And without those systems, it, the whole thing will just blow up. Agreed. Yeah, good point. Good share there. I think there's a lot of good books people can read in their entrepreneurial journey. And that's one of them. I think we've all read that book. I, I know I have. It's been several years since I read it, but it was a good read. Kind of teaches you that. The SOPs, putting systems in place and things like that. So you started and you started growing the business. You could kind of see that demand was increasing. You were growing, you were learning. Take me through like, you know, getting to that point where you're really busy and you decided, hey, I'm going to have to get out of the field as maybe the supervisor or as the, okay. the crew leader and then moving from there. Sure. Well, I guess I would say what forced me to that decision was my body breaking down and I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and I, I got fortunate enough that a climber came on just as my body was really breaking down. And um, I then became the salesman. Uh, he, I had a crew doing the work. I was selling the work, still pretty terribly managed in general. It wasn't until my wife came on board. So I met, I met my wife, Amy, in 2013. We got married in 15. She came on to the company in 14. And she she's who put systems and processes documented into the company and made the scaling of the company possible. I had nothing to do with that. I don't, I'm not minded. I don't have a mind for that. Um, she's genius in that respect. And so, you know, we were two very complimentary people that made, you know, Arbor Aesthetics, as you know it today, very possible. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I knew that we needed it, but I didn't yeah. have the capacity to do it. And that's the case for a lot of tree guys out there. You're good at climbing trees. You're good at cutting trees and you're managing a job site. Um, back office systems processes is not your genius. My advice to people in that situation, which I think is most of you, is find somebody that is really good at those things and bring them on board. I got lucky. I happened to marry. Well, that's not always what I'd necessarily recommend is uh, marry that person, but that's how we did it. And it, and it worked out. I, well, I think the key point there is hire somebody to do this. If you're really serious about growing it, or it's just kind of, kind of stay in the same place if that's not your strong suit. And, and right. I see this pretty often. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, they're, they're okay. So I went to, I went to the TCI expo for the first time in 2013 and I was, a, you know, a little tree guy of maybe two or three people bringing in about $200,000 a year cutting every corner I could, charging as little as I could get away with, because that's, in my mind, how you got the job. And I, my body was broken, and I was broke, and I was unhappy with it. I was looking for something different. And what I saw there was everybody who had money, who seemed to be pretty happy with their lives and doing well, they were as professional as possible. They charged the highest price as possible, and they did. They set the industry standard, and they were always pushing it. It wasn't how little can I do so that I can save as much money as possible is the other end of the spectrum. And that was a huge awakening for me. 
Um, it, likewise with their business. I mean, do what you do well. Um, set higher standards for yourself and your people and grow your business along those lines. Wow. So powerful point there. And that was only nine short years ago when you said you went to the TCIA meeting in 2013. Yeah. So 200K to what you're doing today, multiple millions of dollars in revenue. So what, I guess, just going to these meetings and, and talking with other people that are already doing it is helpful, A, right? Being a part of these associations. Oh, yeah. Meetings. Yeah. And, and just kind of realizing that you need to make some changes in order to kind of go to the next level. Right, right. It, so, I mean, I would say some key fundamentals, if there are like to-dos that you could do right away. One, joining TCIA was really huge for us. Finding peers um, that are of similar size to us, but are that also that are maybe two, three, five years ahead of us, like a a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar company isn't going to learn a lot from a five million dollar company because that's so far ahead that it's just it's too abstract to even wrap your mind around. Sure. But a two hundred fifty k company talking to a seven hundred and fifty k company, that that is a breachable gap. You can you can bridge that gap and get there. So finding those peers that are doing it that are just a little bit ahead of you, and you don't have to solve all of your problems yourself. Other people, smarter people than you, have solved these problems. They're not trade secrets. You can visit other companies. I've visited many companies and learn what they're doing. Uh, you may not find a lot of cooperation in, in your own region, but that's where TCIA is uh, really strong, where you can find friends in different parts of the country that will openly share all of their secrets with you. Love that. Yeah, that's great. Just to talk to other business owners that are doing it, that have already been down the same road you have. I mean, just in my agency, we're members of a mastermind where there's 200 plus agencies in there and we all mm -hmm. kind of share best practices, right? You learn from each other um, and all of that. So that's that's powerful. And, and nine years ago, well, from, from there to here. And so a lot of people watching this, by the way, if you're watching this later on a replay, uh, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got plenty more expert interviews coming up and your 2023 marketing plan coming up this Friday that'll be on the YouTube channel as well. But that's really powerful. Nine years, a lot of people think they're going to grow their business into multiple millions in two, three, four, five years. And, and while that may be possible in an up, very hot market, may not be sustainable. So nine years is not even that long if you really look at how long we're going to be on this earth or how long you're going to be in business in general. That's a pretty fast growth to get to that particular level of your business. Um, and so looking at other companies that are already doing it before you, seeing what they're already doing, how they've got processes in place, crews in place, crew leaders, whatever, and just seeing it with your own eyes is probably very helpful. Kind of visualizing it yourself to do that, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Visualizing it yourself. Um, it, well, my wife and I grow relentlessly. Like we're part of entrepreneurs organization. We've tried out Vistage. We've done a number of other things, but uh, we're, we're, we're either spending money on coaching, on therapy, on consultants, or all three of them. Uh, we're always pushing. And by growing ourselves, we're able to attract, I'm never going to hire somebody that's smarter and more experienced than me, that looks down to me, right? That I don't have anything to offer. So I need to continue to grow myself in my, if I'm going to attract those people. So a key part of our growth strategy, I mean, if you just want to um, join an organization, whether it's TCIA, whether it's Entrepreneurs Organization, whether it's Vistage, constantly grow yourself, both professionally and personally. You're not going to, you're not going to, you're never going to hire a better leader than you are as the owner of the company. They just wouldn't, somebody who's a stronger leader than you is not going to be attracted to you, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd say also a key part of our growth has just been that relentless personal and professional growth. Uh, key part of that is therapy. Like I, I know that a lot of my experience with the tree care industry, most of us did not get into tree care on our very best day. Most of the people that work for me and most people I've talked to, they landed here after a lot of other things didn't work out. They didn't know that this this line of work even existed. And somehow this answered a problem that they had in their life. This tree care worked with them. But yet we, we come with all of this trauma from childhood, um, all these learned behaviors that are destructive in our lives. And we have these giant egos that forbid us from you know facing the fact that the way we're showing up every day isn't working this giant 
chip on my shoulder is not making me a better employee and or it's not allowing me to better mentor my my team. In fact, I'm an asshole to all of my employees because I need to make sure that they know how awesome I am or however you play this out. But um, like one of my goals here and one of the reasons I'm, I'm talking to you to here, here today, Wes, is to um, talk about the power of, you know, healing that trauma. The power. I, if part of my story, I'm going to kind of go down a rabbit hole here, but part of my story is I got I got sober in 2012. Like I was an Adderall addict for many years. I got sober in 2012. I got a new psychiatrist who I told the same story I told my old psychiatrist. And rather than saying, you know, well, here, here, Jeff, here's your script and may you continue your addiction. He told me, Jeff, you got a problem. You need, you need to go to a treatment facility. And rather than telling him to F off and like flipping his table over, I, I had this sense of, oh shit, maybe this is it. This, maybe this is, uh, climbing that mountain to sobriety i did not know how i was going to do that and here it was before me and so um thankfully three days later i checked myself into a treatment facility and and thus began the long road to where i am today a year later i got into this you know cataclysmic uh, codependent relationship with a woman um that you know it ended um tra well Ended extremely painfully, and I had the realization that I don't know how to have relationships with people. Um, certainly not romantic. I don't have any friends. I'm lonely, and I don't. I cannot continue to live life like this. So again, I found um, I found dialectical behavior therapy, which saved my life. It's the foundation for me as a leader. Uh, it's the foundation of my marriage, and I talk about it very openly because I see so many people out there making choices, living lives, living, they're just re, they're unconsciously living out the trauma of behaviors learned earlier in life, uh, trauma that they were subjected to, and it doesn't have to continue to be that way. And for a lot of people, what they need is um, a model of doing it, permission to do it. Oh, somebody I respect has done that. Somebody I respect is successful because they did that. They were a total fucking basket case. I was a total basket case. Ten years ago, I was living in my mother's basement. I did two hundred thousand dollar company. And I was living in my mother's basement, and I had just had an affair with a woman, and she was uh, going to have a child, and she miscarried, and my whole life blew up. And had that not happened, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be the success I am today. It was that event which was a pivot point in my life that you know, I'm. I don't know that I'm. I'm not proud of those things, but. Uh, I, for me to be the basket case I was to where I am today and on the trajectory where I'm going, I just imagine that so many people have that same potential if they do the work, if they give themselves the permission to you know, recognize that um, the things I'm doing aren't working for me. They're not working for my team members. They're not working for my family. I can be better. And it's, it's okay that I'm not perfect. I'm not, I still am deeply invested in therapy and can't believe I have so much work left to do. No, thanks so much for sharing that. I appreciate yeah. that. That was that's a powerful message to anybody watching. I think there's so many people out there. You're, you're right. And a lot of people are afraid to admit it, but it's an issue that they have internally that they need to deal with. And I think you can get help with a number of different places, right? In your local community or even with somebody that, that just points you in the right direction or just knowing somebody has been through it before gives you that courage to kind of go and get that help. I mean, in my past, alcohol was a big thing, right? I think a lot of people have these types of vices or things that they do yeah. they really want to admit they have an issue or anything like that. Today, it's, it's drastically different. I don't have an issue with anything like that, or even maybe past issues, what people would thought, but I mean, everybody's kind of going through some sort of trauma or something from their past that kind of keeps them trapped in a spider web that maybe if they just reached out and got help and just weren't afraid to admit it, they could get past it and get over it and get through it quicker. Right. And that's kind of amen. a similar story to you. Amen to that. Yeah. So thanks so much for sharing. I think anybody watching that's going to get a lot of value out of that. So thanks so much. So take me through, you, you got you got through all of that. The business mm -hmm. continued to grow and everything was moving along and, and getting larger. I mean, I, I saw on the website, you guys got a, a team or an army of arborists over there. Everybody's certified on the team. So you guys are doing great things in your local community there at Omaha. What does it look like nowadays? Like what's your ideal customer? Like maybe what size company are you? What, what type of... Um, like, who are you kind of going after in your local community as far as customers go? Sure. So we're going we're going for higher end, like upper middle class to 
upper class clients, people with disposable income, people who are capable of paying for the experience of working with us. We you know one, they they want a guarantee of the quality of work that we're gonna perform, but it's more than just I mean, a lot of people can do quality work. Not everybody can run a company professionally. Not everybody can create a good experience or have employees that are on site that, you know, are shaking the client's hand with a smile, that are doing the walkthrough, that have the, a lot of it's emotional intelligence, that have the emotional intelligence to meet an emotionally intelligent client where they want to be met, right? Mm -hmm. We hire for that and we also train for that. But I would say most of that is you can't, well, you got to hire for that. Training that is a long-term game. I I used to be totally emotionally uh, have no I had no EQ, uh, so you can learn that, but that's a much longer game. Um, remind me of your question, Wes. So, oh, so you answered it pretty much. It's, I, it's okay, ideal customer and uh, ideal customer. Yeah, yeah, who who cares about their community? Who cares about um, their their trees? Who knows? I mean, we're not cheap. They have cheaper options. Um, they choose us for a reason. I mean, they believe in our cause and we, in terms of our marketing, we, through Facebook and other social media avenues, we let people know how we take care of our people, how we give back to the community. Um, our purpose is meaningful growth for people and trees. I am. Um, I started, I started the company because I loved trees. Well, my love of trees has, I'm sorry to say it's kind of waned. But in replace, it's my love of people. And I love seeing my people grow. And as I, you know, ascend my own career and I change, I used to be on the front lines climbing trees. And then I used to be, you know, the sole salesperson. And now I'm in this visionary seat trying to stay out of the business as much as possible. And in doing so, uh, I create opportunities for people. And in making their dreams happen, they make my dreams happen. And we talk about that. Like that's, I'm I'm getting out of the trenches to make room for you. If I don't do that, if we don't grow, then you don't have any future. Like what you have is what you can have. If we don't grow, then you don't have any more opportunities. If I don't give myself a promotion into a new seat, then you don't have anywhere to grow either. And so uh, connecting those dots for our team goes a long way towards um, letting them know what what's in it for them, with them, what is in it for them. And in any of the decisions that we make that impact them, the team members need to know, um, why are you doing this? How does this affect me, right? And because I think it's very easy for a business owner to just, uh, it's clear in their head and it's clear to them why they're making these decisions. Um, just trust me, you don't need to know. Well, the understanding of the why will go a long way towards creating buy-in from your people and, and creating that, you know, dis that discretionary effort, having a boss that takes the time to communicate that demonstrates that he cares about my life. Uh, Cause we have an incredible influence over the people that we employ. We're probably maybe the most influential people in their lives because they, they spend more time here than they do with their family. We dictate so much of their lives to demonstrate care, to actually care um, there are real there are real world economic benefits to doing that. In addition to just it's right because you're being a good person and these are people and we're all trying to take care of each other. But you get discretionary effort, um, effort that they don't have to give. I give more than I need to, and in return I get more than I give, and it's it just works like that. That's great. And do you, is it do you go along the lines of like a mission statement, core values of the company? Oh, like huge. That? Yeah. Yeah. So core values, I, you know, if there's something that we're exceptionally good at it's hiring and living living out our core values so our core values are take ownership have courage show up and serve right our purpose is meaningful growth for people and trees our vision statement is creating connection through trees and our oh i forgot mission vision values our mission is uh better together um we are better together. Like I, I'm fine without them. They're fine without us. But together, we are greater than the sum of our parts, right? We can do so much more but with these complementary skills, with this shared vision. We're all rowing in the same direction. Um, and then it, like that also needs to be communicated regularly. Why are we doing this? Why are we better together? Why is this more than just a job? I mean, if it's just a job, you can go get a job anywhere. That's exactly where I was going with it. So when you were saying, you know, kind of sharing your why with your team and, and even your, your customers and your clients, 
it goes a long way in having that written mission statement, that written core values, because they can constantly refer to that. And then, you know, as you communicate that with your team and everything, they just, it just kind of continues to like permeate in their head. Like this is why we're doing what we're doing, gives them more of a purpose as a team. So uh, a powerful thing you mentioned there. So everybody watching, try to get something like that put together for your business. I promise it'll take you a lot farther if you have that in place. Yeah. Let me spend a little more time on that. Mm -hmm. um, really key in creating your, your, your values, um, your core values is this, it has to be true to who you are. It is not a wish list of things that you want to be true about your, yourself, right? Um, taking ownership, having courage, showing up and serving, those are things we radically believe in. We live them out personally and here. If if those weren't true about us, having, having that uh, as a core value, well, we would just show up as a fraud every day and everyone would know that. So really being honest with yourself about what your core values are and then taking the opportunity whenever you can to live them out have them posted but talk about them we have a core value core value champions program where guys uh team members nominate each other throughout the week for you know i jeff nominate cindy for show up and serve and this is what she did and once a week we read those out so i get to read out loud amy and i get to read out loud the awesome things that the team did um, to and for each other throughout the week. And then we played Plinko for cash. Uh, we, you know, select somebody to get to play Plinko for cash. But it's fun, and it celebrates doing that stuff. And it creates ownership. It creates buy-in. It creates a sense of family and community. And it brings to life those those values. They're um, being mindfully lived out. I think that's awesome. That's something that I just took a note on and that I could implement in, in my agency and our team is acknowledging people for the good things they did for the week. I think that's an awesome thing that you do because it, it gives people that feeling of, oh, I belong here. I'm doing the right thing. And you're acknowledging it as the, as the owner or as the superior to that, that particular person. So that's awesome. Those are great shares. I think we were talking uh, right before we started airing about you guys are doing a lot of plant health care in the market. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of companies that, that we work with now are doing that. A lot of people we're talking to are kind of moving to evolve into that. Take me a little bit through, like, what do you think you guys company, like percentage wise of your business and revenue is plant health care versus just traditional tree services or, you know, just roughly? I mean, is it half and we're, half, do you think? Or is it most? Oh, no, well, that would be that would be fantastic. No, we're about 30 percent. Plant health care. Plant, plant health okay. Care. And we didn't we didn't start offering plant health care until 2016. Okay. So EAB, Emerald Ash Borer came to town and everybody went crazy. So uh, that was an easy chance for us to dip our toe into offering plant health care services. And then we hired um, we hired a, a, an applicator from another company and he helped bring some of the most basic services possible. Like I didn't want to offer every service under the sun, but <clears throat> Everybody has a crab apple. Everybody has a spruce tree or pine tree, and uh, those are high volume sales. So we started off with um, emerald ash borer, cedar apple rust, and pine fungus and spruce fungus. Uh, those were easy enough to get into, and um, so we built volume on the things that we could do easily. We knew we could execute without making mistakes, and we built complexity into the system over time. So yeah. I mean that's. We we hired somebody that knew what they were doing, and then we uh, started off simply, got all the low-hanging fruit, built complexity over time. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, a lot of people are just really kind of talking about that and learning about it. Some people are in the process of getting their you know, they're training in for that. So they can kind of start offering that as a company. So some of the people listening are like, this is all great. You know, thanks so much for sharing all of this. And, you know, Jeff, you went from 200K in nine years to multiple millions now, like take me through what what type of marketing did you guys do to kind of grow the company and get more awareness out there? I'm, surely it wasn't all word of mouth, right? So you probably had to do some marketing and things like that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so no, it wasn't all word of mouth. Yard signs were very effective for us for a long time. Uh, we don't think they they match the image of our company anymore, so we stopped using them. But they were effective, and I'm glad that I used them. And I used them up even until you know a couple of years ago. Okay. Uh, we're on the radio. So we've got a radio spot that my wife and I do together, and she writes the ads. Uh, my mom, my my Amy, my wife and business partner, she's got a great mind for marketing and um, uh, graphic design. So uh, that's fortunately an in-house skill that we have. Um, we've got a referral program. 
this is probably our best source. I mean, our, our, we get our biggest return and our highest close ratio on a referral program. If a current client refers somebody, they get a $20 gift card to a flagship restaurant. So flagship owns a lot of great restaurants here in Omaha. They can mm -hmm. use that $20 gift card to any one of those restaurants. Um, people love those gift cards and it's something that we track. And it's, so it's not just, I would say our close ratio on that is, you know, I don't know the number, but it's higher than anything else. Yeah. Referrals are always great, right? Yeah. It's higher yeah. than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, radio ads, hard to say. We know a lot of people hear them. So it's great awareness of us. Mm -hmm. Facebook, we're not get, actually Facebook ads. If we get people from face, Facebook leads are terrible. Their, Facebook is really good for staying in front of our current clients. Yeah. But the people who contact us because they heard about us on Facebook or th especially through Facebook, mm -hmm. terrible leads. Google, yeah. terrible leads. Because if they're contacting you through Google or Angie's List or any another, other of these, it's just it, they're kind of bottom feeders, right? There's nothing special about – Arbor Aesthetics is special and different, okay? There's Arbor Aesthetics, there's, and then there's everybody else. If you're listening to this in Omaha, <laughs> well, that's at least that's the persona, the presence that we are trying to create. Like we sure. want people that want us, right? Um, and this is if you're in Omaha or wherever you're listening, that's what you want. You want clients that want you and, and really like create a sense of, you know, it's it's a big deal to be working with you. And you um, and if you knew how hard we worked at creating that, you'd wonder why we weren't better. Right. Uh, that's it's just that level of intensity. Um, those are a few of the marketing strategies that work and, and don't work. Like we don't advertise on Google mm -hmm. uh, or Angie's List or any any of those others because it's you're getting, you know, you're getting a lot of low bidders. They're yeah. Really, and we can't compete with the low bidder. Well, I think what you're doing, you know, you said a couple of things there. I think the radio spots is just creates this humongous awareness of Arbor Aesthetics. People hear that all day, every day or when the commercials air and whatnot, um, your reviews and ratings on Google are very good. So I think that goes a long way too in saying, hey, this is a good company, even if you know you do get a few leads from, from internet search or whatnot, some of those people coming in. So having that good reputation and good reviews, it, obviously you guys take a, um, you, you put an importance on that, which is, which is what we always recommend too. Because if people are going to find you on Google search or find you from different you know, nooks and crannies of the internet, whether that's YouTube or Google or social media, they're going to go look at your reputation and your reviews sure. to see if they can find any dirt. So I think it's super important that you guys have taken a liking to that because I think that's a big, huge thing that a lot of people miss or don't put a lot of effort into getting those reviews. Right. And I think they just pay dividends as you keep growing your business and, and building your awareness and getting the name out there. So, so radio, got a website you probably show up pretty highly in certain certain areas online you got the good yep. reputation so yard yep. signs were a big thing for a while but now you got all your trucks wrapped too so that probably kind of replaces some of that right i hear a lot of people say i see your trucks everywhere they didn't used to yeah. say that so yeah um and yeah and then just in terms of the image that we want to uh project that we are it doesn't doesn't fit us anymore to put yard signs in okay so the existing client base you mentioned a good point earlier any existing referral, we were going to send you a gift card to your you know, one of the local restaurants of $20. Yeah. So that gives people the incentive to do it. And if you give somebody an incentive, a cash incentive, gift card incentive, whatever it may be, people will go out of their way and do more of it. I see people yeah. do some similar for Google reviews or, hey, if you leave us a Google review and a Facebook review, if you do both, we'll send you a gift card for 20 bucks. Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do to kind of incentivize people to give you what you need, especially yeah. if you're doing a good job. If you're doing a good job, people will want to do it for you. And I would say, like, like, look, what makes you different than every other tree company out there, right? Uh, there probably is something. But if you're not making the public, your audience, your clients aware of it, then you're just another tree company, right? Very true. Yeah. You got to differentiate yourself. Make maybe some sort of slogan or some sort of core values that you're kind of putting out there. Will, will help you differentiate um, and live it people. live it and then yeah. put uh, put that out into social media like if you're going to get involved with so we have a charity program gift of beautiful trees that we do every year so we uh we take nominations um we we, have, we take nominations from various different sources online radio what have you and then we select a family based on need they've got a tree or trees that are problematic and then it's usually like they're suffering from cancer they lost their son or some really traumatic life event and we select those families and 
we do tree service at no charge. Now it's just tree service. So I mean, how big of a deal is it really? But what we found, I mean, it's one human helping out another human. It's this, we've seen like, we've seen people turn their lives around from it, just from the kindness, you know, the human gesture, one human being kind to another human. It's, um, and we've extended this, we brought on other companies so that it's more than just Arbor Aesthetics that can do this. We've got other tree companies from Omaha that have, joined our effort to do this but do those kinds of things um if you're inclined to if that's who you are um, or if you're a veteran helping veterans out but what's your thing what's, yeah what what makes you special i think that's a great great point and a really good share because i, I just we did an uh, expert interview with a company in connecticut recently and they mentioned something similar so to get their business growing and to get that kind of momentum going, they did offer their services locally in some sort of awareness group or something like that, where it was like a local community effort thing. And they were the tree company in there that would provide the free tree services or consultations or whatever. And they did a lot of that free stuff for a few years or several years. And it just got them on the map because that particular um, nonprofit organization would share all of their information everywhere and it just goes almost viral. And you're, yeah, you're doing it for like no cost or, or low cost or, or cost or whatever it may be. But just the fact that you're giving back, it gives you that 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 branding and that appearance that you're just a good company doing the right thing out there. You know, I'm, my, my thought on the low cost, my, we're we're expensive or we're free. We're never cheap. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and yeah. my advice to people like if you if you're giving it away, you've just created like the value in your client's mind. If they've mm -hmm. tasted your work cheaply, it will never have more value than that again. I, that's been my experience anyway. So um, if you're going to do it for cheap, may as well do it for free. Um, because, at least that is our motto, because I don't want anybody to get the idea that we're cheap because we're not. We can't be. You can't be excellent and cheap. You right. can't take care of your people and be cheap. Sure. Uh, and I'll also throw out there, I think there's sort of a, a trifecta of like if there's if there's a low price, somebody's getting taken advantage of. It's either the owner, the worker, or the client, or all three, right? Somebody's getting screwed in that. So and the price needs to be high enough so the owner is taken care of, the employees are taken care of, and the client is taken care of. There has to be that margin there. Um, and there has to be margin there if you're going to have a company that offers benefits or pay, like wages that are worthwhile or culture. Culture is really expensive. That takes money. That takes time. Um, a lot of building a great company is creating a company that offers value to the client enough that they will pay you um, a wage that you can build a great company with, right? It's raising a rocket. It's really damn hard to do. That's it's right. A whole lot of effort. Yeah. Well said. Thanks for sharing that. So I think some of the local community groups could be like veterans types uh, organizations, uh, senior citizen type organizations, sure. right? One guy I interviewed couple of months back, several months back, he shared something that he did in his local community to get involved with all the high net worth individuals. And what he did was, yeah, yeah what what he, did, he did. So what he did was there was like a local opera type group or, or big association. And there, there was okay. always these, these events. And I think it was like Nashville or something like that. And they were coming all the time, right? It was like a couple of times a year. So he networked, he joined that association and he was part of that association. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wealthy members and he literally would just talk to everybody about what he did. And that grew his plant healthcare side of his business tremendously and exponentially over the next like five to 10 years. And I said, wow, that's a that's, pretty cool share. You know? What was that? That is a good share. What was that organization he joined? I can't remember. It's something about the local opera or something. It was some sort yeah, you, of like opera or. We, we see a lot of our clients at, at the local symphony. So. Yeah, things like that. <laughs> that's where they, they hang out. There's membership groups for stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. So those people yeah. are all together. And I mean, what better place, right? They can afford your services. They see the value and all that stuff. And it's just a great place to be. Yeah. Um, so when he yeah. shared that, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, well, great, Jeff. I thank so much for, for sharing today, man. I think this has been incredible so far. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of what you, what you shared today on this interview. Uh, what would you say to maybe the tree service business owner getting started, right? He's getting started. Maybe they're getting a little frustrated. They're, they're getting some momentum. They're growing their business. They're right there. All they really need to do is just stick with it. And, and have that determination, that grit to keep going. What would you give that person? What kind of advice would you give that person? Oh, well, I, I don't know if I'd give advice, but I'd give an experience share. There have been the only, if there's one thing that I can really credit for my success here today is that I didn't give up. There have been so many times along the way where it made sense for me to quit 
right? Like when all of my gear was stolen in 2008, like my 10,000, like everything was stolen in 08. And then my, I had like uh, my truck collapse and uh, had, like I had to pawn my GRCS so that I could buy a new chainsaw to keep going. Like that, that was a good point to cool. just call it quits. Sure, throw in the towel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say one, there are a lot of people out there where it probably does make sense to call it quits. Like I know some companies here in town where I think, what are you doing? You were, you were doing better when you were working for somebody else. You were literally making more money and your life was manageable. So uh, making like it, quitting sometimes is okay. It was a good idea for me to quit school. Maybe usually that isn't the case, but it was for me. Um, I knew Arbor Aesthetics was different, but if you're like, I would say generally speaking, if you start, making better decisions there's a brighter road ahead of you but if you continue to do the things that if you're not going to make a change then your current state is probably going to continue if where you're at sucks and you're just going to continue to do what you've been doing don't expect for anything to change and then that might be a good opportunity to well either quit what you're doing the bad decisions that you're making or look into a new line of work but um so this probably isn't the answer that you were looking for but i would say you know, you can start making better decisions. Um, hiring, hiring a consultant, hire, um, joining the TCIA, joining entrepreneurs organization, hiring a traction consultant or EOS. There, we haven't talked about EOS, entrepreneurs operating system, the book traction that was fundamental to us launching uh, or, or scaling the business. Um, if you're under a million dollars, joining entrepreneurs uh, accelerate like EO Accelerator was transformational for our business. And I'm happy to talk to anybody out there who wants to contact me about any of this. I'm, I'm an open book. I'll talk to you about this, but um, don't try to do it on your own. If you're doing it on your own and you're stuck, don't expect that to change. You're going to have to do something different to get different results. Um, and if you're contemplating before you quit, try something different is what I would say. But if you're unwilling to try something different and you're suffering and your business is going nowhere, there might be a better opportunity for you out there. Like not everybody is meant to own their own business. That's the truth. Very true. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was, that was incredible. So guys, uh, I, I want to be cognizant of Jeff's time. I know he's been on here. We've been on here about 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes. So thanks so much for sharing everything today, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Um, hey, come on again sometime. If anything else pops up that you want to discuss in the tree industry, man, we're happy to have you on anytime. So we appreciate you sharing your thoughts today. If you guys are on YouTube watching this after the fact, go ahead and like and subscribe to our channel. If you're on the podcast, we're on all the major podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Google Play, all the above. Uh, and we'll have more episodes coming up soon. And until next time, uh, we will talk to you then. Thanks so much, Jeff. Have a good day. Thanks, Wes.